Well, good morning and welcome to South Point, where we're one church in multiple locations. I want to say good morning to our Lusby campus. Everyone waves at our Lusby campus. Hey, Lusby, we're so glad you're with us today. Uh, we're so glad that everyone here is Leonard Town. Is anyone fired up to be here this morning at Leonard Town? All right, Leonard Town. We want to say hi to those of you that are watching on our YouTube channel. We're so glad that you're here with us. My name is Matt. I'm part of the team here at South Point Church. Hey, today we're going to start a brand new series called What Keeps You Up at Night? And I just want to thank Eagle Brook Church. They actually created the logo and the design, uh, but the sermon series is ours. But um, So we're just going to do this for the next couple of weeks. The next couple of weeks we're going to go over this, What Keeps You Up at Night? Um, and we just want to talk a little bit about a silent epidemic um, that is kind of overtaking our country. Um, and it's probably something that each and every one of us has actually experienced at some point in our life. Um, and this silent epidemic is something called worry. Now, I just want to take a quick survey. I want you to raise your hand if you've ever worried about something. Just go ahead and raise your hand. Um, everyone should have their hand raised because at some point, I bet all of you have worried about something. So over the next couple of weeks, this is going to apply to all of us that we worry. Matter of fact, if I was really honest, I have a confession worry and stress and kind of fear and anxiety is something that I've struggled with on and off almost my whole life. As a matter of fact, just a couple weeks ago, I had kind of this episode where like I was so stressed, I was so worried, I was just kind of so freaked out that like I just didn't sleep well through the night. Has that ever happened to anyone where you just were like stressed out and you had trouble sleeping and, and you know, it, what was keeping me up at night? And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened. Um, a matter of fact, I don't know if you know this or not, but we just finished graduation season. Congratulations to all the high school graduates. Woo! All the college graduates, all the master's graduates, all the graduates pre-K. Hey, listen, when your kid graduates from pre-K, it's okay. They've got a lot more graduations to go. Anyway, so anyway, listen, it was graduation season. Um, I was at the office. I was working, and I came home, and when I walked through the door, I was hit with something very, very instantly. My house was 85 degrees, <laughs> and I went, what is going on? And my wife said, the AC isn't working, and our AC isn't very old. It's only, only like seven years old, but we walk, I walked in the door, and it was, it was hotter than it is in this high school right now. It was just hot, blazing hot, right? And I'm like, what is going on? And so I checked the breaker, and you know, I did all the little things that I know how to do. And I was just like, man, this couldn't happen at a worse time. And here's why. Because that following week, my, I had family coming in. My daughter was graduating. My wife was just finishing up interning for her master's degree in counseling. And so we'd been kind of on half income. And, and I was like, oh, my gosh, we've already replaced the compressor. I can't believe this. I have a big project coming up at work. I mean, life is just happening all around me. And now I'm going to have to replace my whole system. It's going to be five or six grand. And I've got to pay for, like, a graduation gift. i got a family coming in. I have all these things things going on at the same time. And that night as I tried to sleep, all I could picture was all the worst case scenarios that would happen with all those things. And here's kind of the amazing thing is a week or so went by, we borrowed an air condition, we got the house kind of cool enough, and when family came, it was fine, and my daughter graduated, and that went well, and we finally got someone out to fix the AC, and it wasn't a need for a new AC, yes, thank you, God, right? I didn't need a new AC, matter of fact, it was a fraction of the cost that I thought it was going to be, but it was still a lot of money just for a working class person, just everyone knows, like it was still more money than I wanted to pay, but it wasn't a brand new system. And here's what I thought, I thought, listen, I spent all this time, I spent all this time and energy <coughs> worrying about something that didn't happen. And it got me thinking, have you ever spent time and energy and sleepless nights worrying, stressed, or fearful about something that eventually never, ever happened? Now, before I go any further in the message, I want to kind of separate something. I want to talk about kind of the worry that everyone experiences and the difference between clinical anxiety or clinical depression, because those are very different. And I just need to make a confession, and I want to make an apology. I apologize. The church has not helped take mental health issues out of the shame corner. And so I just want to make sure this morning that if you have a clinical issue with anxiety or depression, like, I don't want you to feel shame. Listen, like, and as a matter of fact, I'm going to put it up on the screen, and I want to say it this way. Listen, clinical depression and anxiety are, what's the word? 
They're medical issues, not spiritual ones. And so I just want to say that the church should not be a plain place of shame where we tell people when they have like a mental health issue like depression or anxiety, we should just go pray or read the Bible more. Listen, if you fell and you broke your leg, I would pray with you. But I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to take you to the emergency room and I'm going to get someone to get you some help. And listen, if you struggle with clinical depression or clinical anxiety or some other kind of mental health issue, listen, the biochemistry and the physiology and the neurology in your brain isn't working the way it's supposed to. So should we pray? Yes. But it is a medical issue, not a spiritual one. Can the church be a place that takes mental health issues out of the shame corner into a corner where we can love people graciously for Jesus? Now, as we kind of continue on, listen, listen, it doesn't really matter who you are or where you're at in your spiritual name. Listen, it doesn't matter whether you have no faith. It doesn't matter whether you have different faith. It doesn't matter whether you're a follower of Jesus. Here's what I know. Each and every single person watching this video here today, listening to it, you at some point will experience stress. You'll experience worry. You'll experience fear. You will experience anxiety. Matter of fact, there's a bunch of things that we worry about. I'm going to put them up here on the screen. Listen, we worry about relationships, don't we? Listen, come on, listen. We worry about relationships. We worry, are people going to like me? Do I have a hanger? Is there something in my tooth? Do my coworkers like me? Does my boss like me? Am I ever going to get a date? Am I ever going to keep a date? Am I ever going to get engaged? Am I ever going to get married? What kind of mom? What kind of dad will I be? What, can I restore my relationship with my mom or my dad or a sibling? We worry about our relationships. And if we've ever been divorced, we go, will I ever have that kind of relationship again? We worry about our relationships. Are we going to get along? Do they like me? Does my family like me? I need my, at least my family to like me. And we worry about not just our relationships, but we worry about our health. I'm too skinny. I'm too fat. I'm too wide. I'm too tall. I'm too short. I have too much hair, too little hair. You know, I've never met anybody that says I'm exactly happy the way I am. Everyone smile because that's us, right? Like we just, we all want to be something different. And then we begin to worry. Well, this, you know, this extra piece of cheesecake caused diabetes. I have a stomach ache. Oh my gosh. And we go on to WebMD and we we discover we're dying, right? Um, and we begin to worry about our health. You know, we begin to work. What about my vision? I'm going to have to wear glasses. And, and you know, what is going to happen? You know, there's a family history of cancer. There's a family history of heart attacks. There's a family history. We begin to worry about our health. And then we worry about money. We worry about, am I going to have enough money? And, and is the money that I have currently going to last? And is it going to be enough? And, and what kind of job am I going to have? Am I going to be able to keep that job? And am I going to get promoted? And, you know, sending kids to college is expensive. Just right, just tip right now. You should invest in the Maryland, whatever thing right now, because it's expensive. Can I send my kids to college? You know, um, will I have enough money to retire on? I don't want to eat Alpo when I get old, you know, like I worry about my finances. And then, you know what? This shockingly, like this, this statistic shocked me. It says that 30% to about 35% of what people worry about most is past things that they can't change. I mean, think about that. 30 to 35% of what you and I worry about is something in the past that we can no longer change. As a matter of fact, we're going to take one whole week to talk about regret. So you're not going to miss that one. But we spend a lot of time thinking about our past. Oh, that mistake. Will I ever be able to get past it? That thing that I did, that, that fight that I got in, that, that wrong decision that I made. Will I ever get? And we go back and we worry about something that we can't change. And then we worry about the future. What is tomorrow? What is next week going to look like? You know, what is my house? You know, what is my kids? You know, what happens when I get old? Will it be enough in my 401k? Will it become a 101k again? You know, we begin to worry about the future. And this is like, listen, listen, listen. This is understandable. I mean, like, here's the problem. Like, Americans used to, we used to kind of like worry about stuff occasionally. We'd occasionally worry about relationships. We'd occasionally worry about health. We'd occasionally worry about money. Occasionally worry about the past. Occasionally worry about the future. But the epidemic has shifted from you and I occasionally worrying to most Americans having a chronic habit of worrying. And this isn't just my idea or my opinion. Matter of fact, I was doing a bunch of research and I want to share some of the research from a recent study that I found. I'm going to put it up on the screen. And here's what they say. Americans' anxiety levels are experiencing a sharp increase in the past year with almost 40% of respondents saying they felt more anxious than they did a year ago. So 40% feel more anxious than they did a year ago. But wait, wait, it says that's pretty big spike following on the heels of a 36% jump between 2016, 2017. So they're saying, listen, in the last two years, 76% 
percent of Americans have had a significant increase in anxiety. As I was doing research, I discovered this amazing but mind-boggling fact. In 1980, only four percent of Americans would deal with an anxiety issue. Now in America, 50 percent of Americans will at some point in their life deal with an anxiety issue. Something is going on where we've gone from occasionally worrying to being chronic worriers. Matter of fact, it goes on to say this. It says, this poll shows that U.S. adults are increasingly anxious, particularly about health, safety, and finances, says the American Psychiatric Association President, Anita Everett. But then she goes on and she says something that was so stunning that I want to make sure that we didn't gloss over, that we heard. Not only were we increasingly chronic worriers, but it has an effect. And here's what it says. It says, that increased stress and anxiety can, what's that word? Significantly. Like that chronic worry, chronic stress, chronic fear, chronic anxiety doesn't just impact your life. It significantly impacts many aspects of people's lives, including their mental health, and it affects their families. Listen, this isn't a church person. This isn't a pastor. Th these are professionals who are interviewing people and seeing what's going on in the country, and they're saying, listen, when you have chronic worry, when you have chronic fear, when you have chronic stress, when you have chronic anxiety, it will significantly impact aspects, including their mental health and their families. Not only does it affect your mental health, not only does it affect your, your families, did you know it affects us physically? Matter of fact, you don't have to trust me. Why don't we trust Harvard? Matter of fact, I found this quote from Harvard Health Publishing. Here's what they says. But when anxiety persists in the absence of a need to fight or flee, Listen, when we chronically worry and we don't actually need to flee, we don't actually need to fight, here's what it says. It said, not only can it interfere with our daily lives, so it says, listen, it's going to interfere with your daily lives, but it also undermines our physical health. Listen, the habit of chronic worry, the habit of chronic fear, the habit of chronic anxiety, the habit of chronic stress is destructive physically, it's destructive relationally, and it's destructive practically. Let me walk you through some of the research that I discovered. Did you know that if you and I have the habit of chronic worry, that we are at a higher risk for our immune system to not work the way it's supposed to. And it usually works two ways. That when we have chronic worry, chronic stress, I mean, chronic fear, chronic anxiety, typically one thing's happened. We'll end up sicker than most people because we're so stressed that our immune system is overdone. Or it does the other thing, it over ramps and you end up with autoimmune issues. Did you know that you are at a higher risk for digestive disorders? And there is a correlation between chronic worrying and digestive and stomach and bowel and all those issues in there. Did you know that you're at a higher risk and that it's scientifically proven that if you're a chronic worry, a chronic stress, chronic fear, chronic anxiety, that you'll have coronary issues, that you'll have heart attacks, you'll have, you'll have blood issues. Did you know that you'll end up with insomnia when you have chronic worry, chronic fear, and chronic anxiety? Did you know that it creates brain function? They did a s survey and they did a study. They said, listen, when you have chronic fear, chronic worry, did you know it actually lowers your IQ? and that it can lead to mental health things. And not only does it destruct you physically, it actually impacts your relationships. Listen, when we're so worried about the past, when we're so worried about the future, we are not in the present. And so oftentimes when we're around family, when we're around friends and things are actually going good, we're so worried about the past or we're so worried about the future, or we're so worried about what may happen that we are present and we miss what is going on right around us. And then also think about it. We, we don't respond. We respond irrationally to our family members when we're stressed and we're fearful. And so we can ruin it with the anger and frustration, our relationships with those that we love. And then it's also destructive practically. I mean, come on, listen. If you don't think fear and worry practically destroy your life, th think about this. Everyone look up here. Think about it. You know, I, I can't tell you the number of people I've counseled who get in a bad relationship because here's what they say. I'm afraid that I'll be alone. So I'd rather be in an unhealthy relationship where someone mistreats me because I'm fearful of being alone. I'm fearful that they might leave me so I'll never address a real problem that's happening in a relationship. You don't think it affects you practically? On your job or your career, I'm competing with other people and I want to make it and I want to keep my job and I'm worried that I'm going to lose it. So you know what I'm going to do? Because I'm worried that I might lose my job, because I'm worried I might not get the advancement, I'm going to take shortcuts. And those shortcuts are actually the things that lead you to losing your job because you shouldn't have taken those shortcuts. How many of us, because we were anxious that someone might not like us if we didn't keep up, we overspent money we didn't have to impress people that will actually never really like us? And it gets worse. 
I'm going to put it up here on the screen. It says this. Chronic worrying often leads to seeking relief in destructive habits. I mean, at some point, there's only so much stress. At some point, there's only so much worry. At some point, there's only so much anxiety that we can take. And we're like, I'm done. Calgon, and that's for all the 1980s people and 70s people, right? Calgon, take me away. But if we're really honest, this is devastating. Chronic worrying leads to destructive habits like overeating, which kills our body. Chronic worrying leads to smoking, which will kill our bodies. Chronic worrying leads to overdrinking, which will ruin our bodies and ruin our lives. Chronic worry can lead to things like pornography or illicit relationships, which will ruin our lives and our bodies. Chronic worrying can lead to self-destructive habits like overspending, which will ruin us financially and impact our relationships. Which leads us to a truth that you already know this morning. If you're one of those type A people and you want to fill in all the blanks, it's on your insert if you pull it out. And it leads us to a truth that we already know. The habit of worrying harms us physically, relationally, and practically. That when you and I are in a, in a state of chronic worry, chronic stress, chronic fear, and chronic anxiety, it will harm us in every area of our life. Now here's the thing. Feelings aren't bad. And if we are really honest, sometimes we can't stop the way we feel. So listen, I want to say something. Everyone look up here. It's so important. Feelings aren't inherently wrong. Sometimes you're going to have feelings of fear or anxiety or stress, and that isn't wrong. How we handle what we feel is matters deeply. Listen, listen. When a feeling handles you versus you handling the feeling, it's a problem. Matter of fact, I like what Lisa Turker, she's an author and writer. I encourage you to find some of her books, and, and she's a great, phenomenal speaker. Um, she says it this way, and I love it, so I'm just going to quote her. She said, feelings are indicators, not dictators. And what she means is, listen, feelings letting you know that something's going on inside of you, something's going on around you, and it's okay to be aware, it's okay to acknowledge that, but they are not dictators. They don't dictate how you respond, and so you and I can have feelings, but we should not let them handle us. We should handle them. And so we're left with a really, really tough question this morning, which is this. Listen, feelings in life are going to happen. Feelings of anxiety, feelings of stress, feelings of worry. It's going to happen. So the question is, if we mishandle them and it's destructive, how do we deal with these feelings when they come up? And having that answer is something that each and every one of us will need. And that's why I couldn't wait to get here this morning. Listen, 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 this is so good. Listen, God knew, God knew that you, God knew that I, God knew that we would struggle with this issue. Matter of fact, Jesus addresses this very issue. Matter of fact, fear not is in the Bible over 30 times. God's tell people to fear not once for every day of the month. There is a verse where God says, fear not. And so this morning, here's what I want to do. I want to share some things that I think these are observations. These are three things that you and I, that when we have anxiety, that when we have fear, that when we have stress, when we have those kind of things, there are three things that you and I can do that will help us in the midst of it. Okay? And here's, the, here's observation number one, if you want to follow along, is that you are not alone. You are not alone. So here, here, here's the reality. I think all of us feel some of this shame game that humanity plays, which is no one understands how I feel. I'm stressed. I'm worried. I'm anxious. I don't want to let anybody know that I'm worried about my finances. I don't want anybody worried to know about my kids, that they have a problem, and I don't want to seem like a bad parent. I don't want anyone to know that, like, maybe I have this addiction problem. I don't want anyone to know I'm struggling in my job. And so we, we have this fear that we're alone, but the reality is, is all of us go through this. One, you're just, you're just not alone in humanity. We, we all deal with this. But it gets better than you're just not alone in humanity is this, that God is with you in the midst of this. And if you don't believe me, look at the words of Jesus. These are the words of Jesus. As he's getting, these are his last words. As he's ascending to heaven, he's conquered hell and death. The tomb is empty. And here are the words of Jesus in Matthew 28. We're going to put it up on the screen. It says, and be sure of this. Now, just in case anybody is wondering what be sure of this means, it means like you can trust this, okay? So just in case you don't know what be sure of this means, he's like, listen, you can take this to the bank. He says, I am with you. I am with you. What does always mean? It means always. Even, like it's not wrong, even to the end of the age. 
Jesus is with you. And you are not alone. And here's what's, here's what's mind-boggling to me. This is why I love God, Jesus, and the Bible. That's why I'm so grateful for the Holy Spirit. Is that not only are you not alone, but did you know that Jesus experienced all the things and the trauma that humanity is, can throw? Jesus experienced betrayal and abandonment. Jesus experienced want. Jesus experienced oppression. Jesus experienced false accusation. Jesus experienced the bustedness and the brokenness of this world just like you and I did. You are not alone. You have a God who not only experienced it, but can empathize with you. You are not alone. Matter of fact, I have um, an app on my phone and I highly recommend it. It's called the YouVersion Bible app. Every day it sends you a verse of the day. Matter of fact, this week it sent me this verse and I was like, man, this is just like Jesus. We're in the middle of this series. It's in Isaiah and I want to read it to you. And we're going to put it up here on the screen. And it says, when you go through deep waters. Now, I don't want to stop here. Everyone look, look over here and listen. Do you notice that he doesn't say you get to skip the deep waters? See, this is where I just need to stop and I'm going to go a little old school preaching. Here's what we want. We want to show up to church. We want the pastor to tell us something or the priest or whoever's up front to tell us something so that we can skip the problems of this world. And this is what I love about Jesus and God. They never lie and say, you get a chance to skip. He doesn't say you'll get to skip the deep waters. He says, I will be with you. See, you have someone who's on your side. You don't get to skip the deep waters. I don't get to skip the deep waters. We don't get to skip the deep waters. But there is someone on our side. God will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you don't get to skip the difficulty. I don't get to skip difficulty. You don't get to skip difficulty. We don't get to skip difficulty. If anybody tells you you get to follow Jesus and skip stuff, they are lying. Because straight in the Bible, God tells us, listen, when you go through the rivers of difficulty, you're not going to skip it, but you will not you want to know why? Because you have someone on your side. You have an advocate. And it goes on to say in Isaiah, when you walk through the fire of oppression, he doesn't say you get to skip the oppression. He doesn't get you get to skip being made fun of or you skip whatever it is that you're probably going through. But you have someone on your side. You will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. You have someone on your side. And here's what's amazing. You have someone on your side who is all powerful and all loving, who's experienced the brokenness that we've experienced, and he is for you. Listen, I don't know how to explain this. I want to remind you, anybody that would die for you is for you. You are not alone. But many times we are fearful and we are anxious and we are stressed because we believe that we are alone. But here's great, listen, there's so much... You are not alone this morning. There is a God in heaven who is for you and he is on your side, but you do not get to skip. And if you remember <coughs> being little, anybody remember being little? Do you remember like you wanted to spend the night over with your best, best friends, your best girlfriend or your best boyfriend? And do you remember when you're little and you were at your house playing and, and you knew that you wanted to ask mom and dad if your best friend could like spend the night? Did you go ask your mom and dad by yourself? No. You know if your mom and dad might say no, what did you do? You always brought along your friend right with him, right up to mom and dad and said, can we spend the night, like you always, you did it together because you didn't want to do it. Because when you have someone on your side, it is much easier to face your fears. It's much easier to face your stress and your worries and your anxieties when you are not alone. And if you walk away hearing something this morning, I want you to walk away knowing the words of Jesus that says, I will be with you always. And here's the thing. Sometimes we think there's a sin or a circumstance that means that God has left us. And I want to get to that in a second, but I just, I want to be really clear. There is no sin and there is no circumstance that can separate us from the love of God found not in a religion, not in a pastor, not in a country, not in a politics, but in a person, and his name is Jesus. That's why at South Point, our number one value is Jesus is a big deal. You are not alone. Which leads me to observation number two, which is this. You're deeply loved by God. You're loved. And you know what? Most of us don't believe it. And I'll be honest, this is one that I struggle with because I know me. 
I know how busted and broken I am. I see all my crazy thoughts. I know all the bad things that I've done in the past. I know who I truly am and I know that God can see it. And sometimes I actually wonder, could God love someone like? But God absolutely, deeply loves you. Matter of fact, I love what the scripture says. We're gonna put it up on the screen here. And it says, there is no fear in love. God is love. There's no fear in love. Perfect love drives out all fear. So then love has not been made perfect and anyone is afraid because fear has to do with punishment. And here's what happens. Here's, here's what happens. Come on, I'm going I'm to break it down. Here's what happens. A problem or something bad happens. We get sick. We get fired. Our AC breaks. You know, the tire goes flat. Someone calls us. And like something bad, a problem happens. And you know what you think? Gosh, God, you don't love me. I must have done something. And he's trying to punish me. But that's not... But that's not what the scripture says. The Bible says fear is because you don't believe in love. Perfect love drives out all fear. God is not looking to punish you. And here's how I know God is not looking to punish you. Because he punished Jesus in our place. You see, that's why we sing songs. That's why we're so fired up on Sunday. That's why we get happy now. That's why we raise our hands. That's why we get together every week to remind ourselves that you and I don't get punished, that Jesus took our punishment, my punishment, your punishment, our punishment. God's punishment has already been doled out on Jesus so that his love could be doled out on us. I was trying to think of a way to explain this. And so, true story. Anybody got teens here? Anybody got teens here? Let's pray for each other, right? We should, we should pray for each other because teens, man. Um, I remember a while ago I was having a conversation. I have two daughters and they're, and they're both teens. Um, they've both graduated high school, so I'm very proud of them. And they're doing really good and they're great and they're awesome and I love them. Um, but a little while ago, one of them was, um, you know, making some decisions that I didn't necessarily agree with. And we were kind of at the dinner table talking about these decisions. And I was like, I think this decision um, is going to lead to pain and it's going to lead to hurt. And I don't think you should make that decision. And they're like, well, I'm old enough and I can make my own decision. You know, we're having that, 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 that adult teen conversation where I'm going, I am for you. I am not against you. I am, I'm not telling you this to like keep you from having fun. I'm telling you this because I love you and I think the choice that you're going to make is going to harm you. But I also have to understand that you're becoming an adult and I have to let you make some decisions so that you can understand that your decisions have consequences, right? And so they were, it was, she just said, I want to make this decision. I said, I don't think that's a bad decision. And then here's what my daughter said to me. She looked me right now and I love it. She's so fiery. She said, well, you can punish me. Now, I did the exact opposite of what you thought I would do. I literally put my head down in my arms, and I, I began to tear up and almost cry. Because my daughter thinks I want to punish her. I didn't become a dad to punish my daughter. I became a dad because I love her. So I lifted my head up with tears in my eyes. I looked my daughter straight in the eye and I said, I don't want to punish you. I love you. Now, if a busted, broken person like me can look at a busted and broken daughter who's awesome and great but is flawed just like all of us, how much more do you think your heavenly father looks at you and I and goes, I have no desire to punish you. I love you. You are deeply loved. The problems that you and I experience in life are not punishment. They're problems because the world is busted and broken. And here's the part that no one wants to admit, but I'm going to say it out loud and you can hate me if you want, but it's true of me, it's true of you, it's true of we, right? Many of the problems that we face are because we made bad decisions. And then we blame God like he's punishing us. And he's going, no, you're just, you just, you're reaping what you said. You get in the, like, it's the law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I'm not punishing you. I, you don't believe me? Here's what the apostle Paul writes to a church. It's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, Romans 8. He writes this. He says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. He's saying, listen, I've been through all kinds of things. I, I, people have tried to kill me. I've been whipped. I've been shipwrecked. 
I used to persecute you. I encountered a risen Christ. But here's what I believe. I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor fears today or worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or on earth below. Indeed, nothing. What does nothing mean? Listen, if you only hear one thing today, I want you to hear this. There is nothing in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus. You are deeply loved. Whenever fear or anxiety or worry comes up, there's some things that we can remember. One is you're not alone. And two, you are are deeply, deeply loved. And there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. And your problems and your struggles aren't because God is punishing you or he doesn't love you. It's because we live in a busted and broken world, which exactly leads into observation number three. If we could just remember this, listen, here it is. We skip to the last chapter and it reveals we, we win. So am I the only person fired up? (laughs) And we win, in the end, we win. Okay. I don't know about you. I've been a Cats fan for a really long time. Yeah, we just became NHL uh, uh, Stanley Cup champions, right? Go Caps, right? I remember my first iteration of the Caps with like Dale Hunter and, and, and that. And then the second iteration with like Joey Juno and Peter Bondra and Ole. Like and just year after year. And then Ovechkin came and I thought we'd finally win a cup. And it's been year after year of disappointment. But in the end, we won. And sometimes I think as followers of Jesus, as we go through life, and we experience problems and pain and loss. And listen, listen, I don't wanna, I don't wanna like not value the reality that when we lose a family member, when we experience problems, when we can't pay our bills, when the brokenness of life happens, it hurts and it doesn't feel good. I'm not, I'm not negating that. But did you know that in the end, we, we win? In the end, we win. I love what it says in Revelation. In Revelation, it says this. We're going to go past the next one. We're going to go to Revelation. Revelation 21, 4 says this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone forever. You see, there will be a day where God comes back, and he will wipe away every tear. He will make every wrong right, and all things will be set right. And people go, Matt, how can you believe that? And I go, because the tomb is empty. There's one who's conquered hell and death and he's going to come back and I don't know what's going to happen in this lifetime and I don't know when he's coming back and Jesus said nobody knows so don't believe the TV preacher. They don't know either. All I know is when he comes back, we win. When I was a little kid, I was so mad. In 1977, I can remember, see, most of you, some of you may remember this. The word blockbuster movie came from the old days that when you went to go see a movie and it was really popular, you literally stood a block outside the theater. It wasn't these megaplexes that they have nowadays. They were small little buildings. And when they got really full, you had to stand outside. I remember in 1977, I stood out line in line for one of the best movies ever. It's called Star Wars. Yeah, let's go Star Wars. I'm a nerd. I'm okay with it. So anyway. I stood out line for, and I was so pumped. It was great. Loved it. Great ending. But I waited three years for the next movie, which was called The Empire Strikes Back. And I hated life for three years. Because in 1980, Luke found out his father was Darth Vader. And he lost his hand. And Han Solo got frozen. And the rebellion was on edge. And what was going to happen? How could a movie end so poorly? And I had to wait three years till 1983 to see Return of the Jedi. And see, here's the reality. See, life is like being in the Empire Strikes Back. Jesus already conquered hell and death. And we're in the middle where life is busted and broken. But there's a day coming where the return of the king will come. And he'll wipe away every tear. And there'll be no more death and no more crying and no more oppression and no more wrong. And he will make everything right. 
in the midst of it, you and I can know this one truth, that no matter how it ends on this side, we win in the end. At the end, we get to hold the trophy, but it's not some trophy made out of metal. It's a trophy of life where life gets to be lived as it was meant and things are restored. Which leads me to the whole point, which is if you're filling out, we're going to put it up on the screen and it says this. It says, peace doesn't come from getting a pass in life. You see, here's what we hope for. We, we, listen, I get it. I don't want it. I don't want my AC to break. I don't want to have a flat tire. I don't want to experience pain. I don't want to get sick. I don't want to have problems. No one wants to have problems. But coming to church, believing in God, following Jesus, putting money, serving, doing all those things, being a part of what's right and doing good doesn't mean you and I get a, no one gets a pass. Life happens to all of us. Peace isn't about getting a pass in life. It comes from who's present with you in your Who's present with you? You are not alone. You have the creator who spoke the universe into existence alongside living inside of you. You are deeply loved. You are not defined by the circumstances. You are defined by a cross that is empty and the tomb is also empty. And you can be aware and know that you will win in the end. So peace doesn't come from getting a pass. Peace comes from who is present, who's with us. And here's where I just, here's where I want to go a little old school. See, many people show up to South Point, and I, I, I get it. Maybe, maybe you fell away from church. Maybe you've never, ever gone to church. Maybe you came to this church because, you know, you wanted to try a different kind of church. Maybe someone dragged you here. And I, I, just, want, I just want to say something. I just want to say something really, really important. See, there's a difference in believing in God, and there's a difference about knowing about God than actually having received God. Have actually saying yes to Jesus. Because listen, life is going to happen and you're going to have fear and you're going to have anxiety and you're going to have worry. And I want to ask you, is it real, do you really think the best option to handle what life throws at you is for you to go it alone? Do you really think the best option for you to handle all that life's gonna throw for you is to medicate your life on things that will create more destruction? Or would it make sense to invite Jesus to hold the wheel of your life, to let him lead you? You see, when we face these things in life, we don't have to do it alone. As we face these things in life, we can, we can understand that we are deeply loved and it is not punishment. That punishment was already given to Jesus. And we can also know that in the end, if we have Jesus, if we said yes and we've received him, in the end, we win. He said, do not fear, do not be troubled. I go to make a place where you can come and be with me. So as I close this out, as we, as we kind of kick off the series and we're going to kind of continue along the same over the next couple weeks, but before we go any further in the series, I want to ask you, have you done more than just believe in God? Have you done more than just know about God? I want to ask you, have you received Jesus? Have you said yes to him? Because life is better with Jesus and we're better at life with Jesus. And I'm not talking about politics. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about a pastor. I'm talking about a personal relationship with one named Jesus. And here's what I can tell you. At 49 years old, I've been following Jesus since I'm 18. And I can tell you this, he will not let you down. He will be with you always. He comes through. He does not disappoint. He does what no one else can do. And so I just want to kind of close this service with a prayer. And if you're here today and you have maybe believed in God, maybe you know about God, but you've never actually received God, I'm gonna pray a little prayer. And here's just, it means following Jesus is just so simple. One is we just admit. We just admit that we don't make the grade, that we've made choices that are wrong, that we've sinned. We believe who Jesus is and that God poured out his punishment and Jesus was our substitute. And that we don't make, we're not made right with God by our religiosity. We're made right by what Jesus did. And then lastly is just commit to follow him. I know too many people go, listen, I believe in God. I love Jesus. I want to follow him, but I know I'm imperfect. Great. So does God. 
God doesn't call you and I to, to, to perfection because he asks us to, try, to aim for that. But he knows that none of us can be that. Just commit to following him. So I'm going to close in prayer. And if that's you, would you pray this alongside with me? Heavenly Father, we are here today knowing that there are going to be circumstances and problems. Not because you want to punish us, but because life is busted and broken. And God, we don't want to go through it alone. We don't want to go through it unloved. And we don't want to lose. So God, today I admit that I'm broken and I've committed faults and sins and I'm guilty. God, I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And that he took my place and took my punishment so that I could be made right with you. And today I commit, I commit not to a religion, but to you, Jesus, to the person of Jesus, to follow you, to let you lead my life. I invite you to come live on the inside of me through the Holy Spirit. Because when we do that, we are never alone. There is nothing that can separate us from the love found in Jesus. And we win. And that is our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.